Now let me tell you about knife making. Making knives for fun is a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it, it's like a kid playing in mud. Uh, you, you may get really dirty, but boy, there's just a, a world of joy in it, okay? That's making knives for fun. Making knives for a living is hard, dirty work. I've been a fan of the Bowie knife since I was a kid. Uh, Washington, Arkansas is the home of the Bowie knife. The heyday of knife making in America occurred in the frontier period when the Mississippi River was the western part of the United States. In places like this, this Hinderleiter grog shop, people would gather and they would transact all sorts of business, especially with uh, cards and uh, gambling and alcohol and with Bowie knives. Arkansas early on was perhaps uh, associated with these self-defense knives more than anyone uh, in the country. In fact, these knives as early as 1834 were sometimes called Arkansas knives which was then expanded sometimes to Arkansas toothpicks. The Arkansas toothpick uh, was uh, the riverboat men. And they carried them up and down and, and picked their teeth with the Arkansas toothpick. But the gentry carried these uh, elegant knives on their hip under their waistcoat. And uh, there is one case in Kentucky where the tailor did, had one sleeve shorter than the other and this fellow killed him with a bowie knife and they went to court and he was justified. It was universally accepted that when you traveled, particularly in the western part of the United States, up and down the Mississippi River Valley area, you were armed. There were many either real or perceived dangers in this area. The advent of the steamboat added a lot of mobility to these travelers. And if all these people were armed, then the local communities felt a little, perhaps, uh, intimidated. What happened was that the people here in these communities began to arm themselves. There's cases when the people required, uh, if you went to the theater, they would collect your bowie knives when they let you in the theater. You know, they were always, all the genteel people had bowie knives. If you were a lawyer or a merchant, you'd want a nice looking weapon, perhaps even with a precious metal, silver or something like that. And James Black of Washington, Arkansas was one of the earliest makers who responded to this market need. Thanks to several writings, we know of James Black. We know that he was a smith in old Washington, Arkansas, which was a jumping off place for Texas. He was actually a silver plater, trained as a silver plater, but he became a blacksmith and then uh, he started making knives. There was a question uh, over the years as to whether James Black really made these knives. But uh, there's one particular knife that came down through Thomas Hubbard a judge in Hempstead County, to his stepson, Augustus Garland, and then down through the Kerrigan family, Steve Kerrigan, uh, and then ultimately to uh, this museum. A direct line which proves the, the kind of knife that James Black made and affirms uh, the, all the stories about Black that have gone on over the years. It is almost beyond even debate that he made a knife for Jim Bowie. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that, that uh, Black made a knife for uh, one of the Bowie brothers, yes. Mm -hmm. 
many people think that a Bowie knife is of one pattern. And actually, most any large knife was called a Bowie knife back during the 1830s. And James Black apparently favored a guardless coffin handle knife. The outline looks like a basic kitchen knife, any kind of knife. But then what he did to make it uh, nicer for the gentleman, you might say, is to um, wrap uh, the end of it in silver, to add a little silver here and there, plating, uh, including uh, this little plating on what they call the Ricasso area. You can see that James Bowie traveled to New York three times, 1826, 28, 32 for sure. And if he had a knife, he could have them made by the, the Eastern makers. And the next thing you know, they have jumped the ocean, and now you have coffin handled knives made in, in Europe. Once these design ideas got to Sheffield, England, they were translated into many more Bowie knives or Arkansas toothpicks than were ever made in the United States. The English would provide all sorts of interesting embellishments, whether it was a cross guard with eagle's wings representing the eagle rampant uh, of uh, the United States or uh, patriotic slogans that were etched into the blades of, uh, of some of their knives um, or other elements which would appeal to the American market uh, trying to sell as many Sheffield knives back to the United States, the point of origin. In recent years, there has been something of a revival of, uh, of knife making. And uh, you might say a, a sort of second golden age of knife making in America. Arkansas, of course, is in the midst of that revival you know, with the bladesmithing school in Washington, Arkansas, with uh, the custom knife maker, Jimmy Lyle, this is the Bowie design. Uh, this is Jimmy Lyle's own version. He was never trying to copy the original Bowie. Uh, but this is a Crown Stag Bowie. Uh, it was made in 1976. And of course, he loved Bowie's because it went back to history. I first met Jimmy Lyle in the mid 60s. Uh, Jimmy billed himself as the Arkansas Bladesmith. And originally, Jimmy was a bladesmith in that he forged his blades. Later on, he made his knives mostly by stock removal. He doodled and drawed all the time. He could, he could draw pictures, and especially of knives and guns, watching television. He did that all of his life. Always carried a pad wherever we went. And we had been planning for two years to go try knife making full time. And uh, he said, if that's what you'd like to help me do, we'll try it. And it was. I, I pushed him to help us go in this together. There was a uh, first article that was written about us. It was 1970 in the Arkansas Gazette, a full page showing Jim, Jimmy at Old Washington in the old um, blacksmith shop making knives and showing a display. On Monday morning, they did us a favor. He was fired and they took his truck and he comes home and says, we are now full-time knife makers. Jimmy, as far as I can remember at this point, exact time was the first full-time knife maker in Arkansas for sure. We had a banker in Marlton, Arkansas that loaned us a thousand dollars on a 66 Chevrolet car that had a hundred thousand miles on it to go in the knife business. Now you talk about a leap of faith. Most knife makers back in those days weren't full-time. You know what I mean? They did it as a sort of a hobby. The Gun Digest uh, of guns, John T. Amber was a friend of Jimmy's through the gun industry, and they and this group contacted us and said they wanted to uh, put an additional story in there on custom knives. Would we be interested? And of course we were. And they held the book up three months for us to build the few knives that went in this book. And um, in the book is some of our our work along with Bo Randall's 
uh, work and uh, several, several other uh, custom makers and here is our buoy and here's our Arkansas toothpick. That article was an important turning point and it had all these knife makers. It, it had Seguin in Alaska, had Jimmy Lyle, had Clyde Fisher, uh, Bill Moran of course. This book put us on, on the worldwide map and we did in 10 months in business because of this book, uh, we thought it would take four years. This is the patented locking uh, folding hunter. And of course, this one has Scrimshaw on it by James Stewart. There were two sides to each knife. That means, you know, that's 600 things you've got to come up with. And well, I mean, think there's just so many ways you can make a deer run, <laughs> you know. Turkey's walking or turkey's flying. It's turkey's a turkey. <laughs> he picked up the subject and for me to work on, you know, put on the knife, and other than that, he'd let me do whatever I please, you know. We started with 12-foot bar stock. We traced our patterns out on the metal. You cut your pattern out on that, metal cutting bandsaw. From there, uh, you grind your sides. You're actually taking metal away to come up with your shape. Then from there, you're, you're doing your finishing up and your polishing. From that, your, your knife is put in a heat treat furnace. You have to do your own heat treating to be able to make sure that uh, you can guarantee your knife. This is what Jimmy wanted to do. If it broke, it was his fault. If you take care of one customer, you've got 10 comes back. Some of his customers have been King Carl Gustav of Sweden, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, John Wayne, Johnny Cash, and even Bo Derrick. But his latest customer has been responsible for putting Jimmy Lyle's work into the motion picture business. We met this man in Sepulveda, California, Joella Thorpe. He was one, had one of the biggest gun stores in Los Angeles. Joe had a lot of friends in the movie industry. Stallone got to visit with Joe, telling him that there was gonna be a movie started out. He said, I want something nobody else has done. Joe said, oh, I know the guy in Arkansas that will make you tonight. He's just a country boy that's, that's what he does for a living is make knives. He called me one day and said he wanted the knife like no one else had, so I designed this one. This was the final design. I made several prototypes, and uh, but this is what was the original first blood knife. Suddenly, combat knives, whatever a combat knife is, appeared and they had hollow handles and they had saw teeth on the back of the blade. The idea of a saw blade on the back of a knife is asinine, totally. It makes it impossible to use the knife for its basic function. I mean, it looks fierce. You gotta remember, we didn't know anything about lighting and about mov movies. He didn't know anything about knife making. The knife for Rambo First Blood Part Two the 100 serially numbered knives were of this configuration with this being black with bright edges to reflect the light since many of their shots were filmed at night. And it features the cross guard screwdrivers also and the compass in the butt and the storage area in the handle. Mr. Stallone said the knife was the star. So that was, that was a shot in the arm for the knife industry worldwide. Boy, did it sell knives. Thousands and thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of knives. Are any of those knives in use? No. Jimmy, of course, did a land office business selling rep uh, replicas of his Rambo knife. Jimmy was a success in the knife business uh, and successful in his life. He was the type that was uh, comfortable around anybody, young or old, rich or poor, whatever. He could talk anybody's language and he could make anybody feel comfortable. Good knife maker. But he was even a greater human being. There ain't never going to be another man like that. Did I? Did I? Not in my life.
I'll never see one. He was probably the second best knife salesman among knife makers I have ever known. And the best is Jerry Fisk. Jerry travels the world. I mean, he's he goes places, works with knife makers in all around the world. Kind of an ambassador of knife making, isn't he? Yeah. And he is also a first great bladesmith. He does superlative work, and he's the only knife maker ever to be named a National Living Treasure by the University of North Carolina. Jerry Fisk has become perhaps the, the best known uh, of all the current bladesmiths uh, in America. It's kind of interesting. You'll see uh, some of the guys will get into this. Oh my goodness, you know, you get $10,000 for a knife. I'd only have to make three a year. And you know, well, there's a drawback to that. It's, well, one, you got to sell them. <laughs> but number two is I've never seen anybody get into it for the money that stayed very long. It's just it ain't worth it. <laughs> okay, there we go. What I did, I started two pieces of steel, or actually three. You always do an odd number. But what you do, your two outside ones will be a plain steel, and your inside steel will be a dissimilar. In other words, it will have nickel, chrome, something in it that will resist the acid when you get to that point. So you bring it up to the knife's temperature, which is say it'll be about 21, 2200 degrees, and you hit it lightly. If you hit it too hard, it'll bounce off itself and it will. You have it, hit it too light, and it won't stick. So you have to learn whatever size hammer you have to hit it with just the right amount of pressure. The only way to learn that is to have a big scrap pile. So you, you weld those together and then you'll simply, we'll, like this one, we drew it out twice as length, we cut it, fold it over on itself. So we started out with three layers and it doubled itself each time. So the next time we had six, we had 12, 24, 48, and then we took this one to 96 layers. After I had welded it, cut it with a chisel and folded it, and it's just laying there cold, I beat it really hard with a hand hammer to knock that scale loose. If you don't break that loose, it, that will prevent you well and I flaws all in there. Borax, when we sprinkle on it, it basically turns to, in a sense, molten glass. And if you have impurity scales and etc., it acts as a vehicle. When you smack it, it acts as a vehicle to carry out those impurities with it. I went ahead and forged the point down on it and a distal taper. That's the taper that would, when you look at it, uh, our bill is laying this way, when you look at it on the edge, it will taper from the handle thinner and thinner to the point, just like a fishing pole. This way, when the guy uses the knife, it will flex better, it's not just parallel. You would always forge your point first, then what we did is uh, I established the length I wanted my cutting edge and then begin to draw it down about half of its thickness. That way, I can set the pattern in. This is manipulated. In other words, you just randomly fold this thing, and then you will forge in your actual pattern or cut it in. What we've done, we've set our pattern in it. So now what I'm going to do is take it over to the grinder, and I'll grind our profile. In other words, the outside of it. I'll take the lumps and bumps and all of it and see what I've got. The blade thickness is about like this. You've got to remember, it, and it looks pretty thick at this point, but you've got to remember you've got to grind down to the bottom of that pattern, so you're going to remove twice this already. We'll put it in acid and we'll kind of slosh it around for about a minute, and that will be enough to bring the actual pattern out in there. But you can see right where we started right here, you can see the angles mm -hmm. and the sweeps of it. So that'd be the, the entire length of it. But it takes about an hour for it to get to its full depth. That's going to look good when it's all said and done. Some folks seem to think that Jerry is lucky, but I'm here to tell you that Jerry pretty well makes his own luck. He works hard. It's got to be something that you're dedicated to do, and so because it's a tough, a tough occupation. Jerry Fisk has made Jerry Fisk. Okay. Um, a. G. Russell has made A. G. Russell. Well, A. G. Russell got here because of the Black Arkansas Stone. I had 
owned an Arkansas stone since I was young. Uh, and in those days, there was nothing finer for sharpening knives. A.G. Russell was uh, a part of that uh, revival too. In, in Arkansas, he started the marketing, particularly in the creating uh, of organizations related to uh, the promotion of this custom knife making. If you want to know anything about the knife business, or what will sell or what won't sell, you talk to A.G. Russell. Only a handful of knife makers make money. Now I try to help them make money. A.G. Russell is probably the number one most important person that we've had in the knife business today. He, he didn't start the Knife Makers Guild, but he, grew, he, he hunted and scraped up this group of people and got them all together and took them to, which you've probably heard the story of, he took them to Las Vegas. And uh, without him, it may have taken another 20 years to get them together, might have not ever got them together. I looked at these people as friends of mine, but they weren't friends of each other. I saw him sit for as much as eight and 10 hours a day calling all the writers that he could hustle up, the gun writers, to write about knife makers. Me, Corbett Sigmund, Bob Lovers, whoever. In the 60s and 70s, my phone bill could run $2,000 a month. I was a gun nut. So when I talked to gun writers, I knew what I was talking about with guns, and I became a source for them of information on knives. And of course, what I was doing was trying to promote handmade knife makers. But the idea that someone would collect literally hundreds of knives for a collection can be traced in large measure to A.G. Russell. I, I have what would have been called at one time a fertile mind. What I can do is, is take a, a knife and with some minor changes in curve and angle, make something that's more pleasing to the eye. I prefer these lines. Now this is integral hilt and butt. Uh, a very slight uh, curve here. I, I don't like extreme recurve. They're impractical, they're hard to sharpen, and, and they don't function well as a knife should. Very early in the game, he got the idea of designing folding knives with particular motifs and issuing them in limited numbers. I carry one of these every day. Uh, we have shipped uh, probably seven, 8,000 of them to uh, troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, that gives me certainly as much pleasure as any of them. But, you know, I'm not done yet. I know because I was there. Without him, you wouldn't have this business we got today. It wouldn't exist. This handle is the Dozier handle because he does it on like an eight inch wheel. He will find techniques or build machinery to do things that other people sit around just wondering, uh, why, why can't I get this done? In, in 1860, they didn't have belt grinders. Didn't have a good choice of steel. So how, how in the world can I take this piece of steel and, and shape it into a knife? I know how. I'll get it hot and I'll pound that damn thing. And I'm gonna beat on it until I beat it into the shape I want. It's kind of like rolling out a, a piece of dough and then cutting donuts out. Uh, today, the steel mill rolls it out and we don't have to pound on it and beat on it. We saw the blade out, we grind it and make a knife out of it. We lay a sheet of steel up and roll it through here and cut a piece off. Then we heat, we use these hardened patterns here. We'll lay on them and, and, and drill the holes, scribe them, saw them out, 
and then go to the grind and profile them. We do not disturb the original grain pattern in the steel. We don't beat it, stretch it, and move it around. We use what the steel mill has done for us. After he rough cuts these on the saw, he comes here to this grinder. The buffers you see, all of our buffers are built by us. They're all DC controlled. This is where all the hand grinding is done in this shop right here. My customers question me often, do you do all the work Bob does? Well, hell no. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to buy a $200 knife from me if I did. We probably make 2,500 knives a year. That's not a lot of knives, it's a lot for handmade. Here's where we do our handle. That's our K2, that's one of our first knives that we, we did after we got into the uh, utility knives what we like to call bare bones. There, there's no nonsense about them. We take off everything that's not needed. We heat treat normally 20 blades to a batch. We don't send our stuff out. To work in this shop, you have to be a carpenter, electrician, a fabricator, a welder. We don't make one knife at a time. I don't know what people talk about. My God, my knives are great. I'm making one at a time. That's got nothing to do with a good knife. Today, who's important? I think I'm important. I'm selling more knives than anybody in the state of Arkansas. My, my knife shop and my knife business is my, is my main reason for living. Without it, I'd probably waste away. I'd be like an old raisin. I'd just drive for nothing left. I decided at an early age or an early point in my knife making career that I was not a knife maker. So I decided that I would leave the knife making to knife making if they'd leave the writing to me. And uh, so I've been writing professionally since about 1950, 51. It is back breaking work. Handles is hard, the forging is fun. The grinding is dirty. I hate straight lines. I try to mend them every way I can. You know, making a living is relative. It depends on what you call a living. There's livings and there's good living. And I make a good living making that. It's 40, 43. But it's still, it's still cutting, it's still shaved. So, uh, it's a great life if you don't weaken. <laughs>